Okay, welcome back. So in this video, we're going to do two things. We're going to start by talking through the strategy that Bertrand and Mullenathan used to identify racial discrimination against black workers in the marketplace. And then we're going to talk through their key findings. So the basic strategy that Bertrand and Mullenathan are going to use is they're going to send fake resumes to a variety of real companies that have posted job openings and try to see whether resumes that are encoded as coming from black workers have a higher or lower callback rate than similar resumes that are encoded as coming from white workers. So in order to do this, they really need two things. The first thing they need is they need a way to signal to employers the race of the worker who's sending the resume. So of course, most of us, when we send resumes to employers, don't list our race directly on, on our resume. So we need some indirect evidence that employers are likely to use to determine an employee's race. And the way that they do this is they put first names on the resumes that are either much more common among white people or much more common among black people, with the idea being that this will effectively indicate to an employer whether an employee is likely to be white or black without indicating any other information. So for example, if we put membership in traditionally black fraternities and sororities versus traditionally white fraternity and sororities, this might be confounded by employers' perspectives on sororities and fraternities in the first place. And then the second thing that we need is a set of resumes that are believable to employers. Resumes that employers are gonna treat like real job applicants that aren't gonna look like something phony and, and cooked up for research. Okay, so the first thing that they need in order to carry out this strategy is a set of names that's gonna effectively signal to an employer that a potential employee is likely to be either white or black. And the way that they do this is they use a set of birth records from the state of Massachusetts from 1974 to 1979 and they see the relationship between children's first name and children's race recorded on their birth certificate. So doing this, they pick out the names that are most likely chosen by white for white children relative to black children and most likely chosen for black children relative to white children. So as you can see here, the whitest names that they find in their data are Allison, Ann, Carrie, Emily, Jill, Lori, Kristen, Meredith, and Sarah. For each of these, these names, they found no black children given this name. And the blackest names that they could find in their data were Aisha, Ebony, Keisha, Kenya, Lakeisha, Latanya, Latoya, Tamika, and Tanisha. And for each of these names, there are either no white children with these names in their, in their data set or very, very few. So for example, for Aisha, the likelihood that a girl named Aisha is black relative to white is 209 to 1. There's 209 black girls named Aisha from this time period for every one white girl named Aisha in the state of Massachusetts. So, if all the employers had a set of statistics from Massachusetts birth records in, in the mid-1970s, this would be completely sufficient, right? Any employer who saw uh, an application from Jill or Lori or Kristen would be confident that that application was coming from a white applicant. And any employer who saw an application from Ebony or Kenya or Lakeisha would be confident that that application was coming from a black applicant. But of course, since real people don't have this sort of data lying around, the researchers wanted to validate this, validate that, that these names are going to be perceived as black and, or as white by asking random people on the streets of Chicago what, what ethnicity they would guess a person had on the basis of their name. So as you can see here, these percentages here are going to tell you the likelihood, the, the percent of um, Chicago residents who believe that someone named Allison was white, named Jill was white, etc. And as you can see, all of these white names are perceived by most people to belong to a white person and all of these black names are perceived by most people to belong to a black person. And we'll see the exact same thing if we look at male names. The names Brad, Brendan, Jeffrey, Greg, Brett, Jay, Matthew, Neil, and Todd are all exclusively given to white children, or none of them were given to black children in the data set that they have. Whereas Darnell, Hakeem, Jamal, Jermaine, Kareem, Leroy, Rashid, Tremaine, and Tyrone were all much more common among black children than among white children. So as a result of this, and again, of course, in the Chicago data, when people were asked to guess the ethnicity of a person who had each of these names, people were generally very likely to believe that these um, African-American male names were given to a black person rather than a white person, and were generally also likely to, to believe that these white names were given to a white person rather than a black person, although with less confidence for Neil and Brendan. Okay. So this should give us confidence that when we send out these resumes, they are effectively conveying information to employers about the race of the applicants. Okay, and the second thing that we need is we need somewhat plausible resumes. 
So if we sent somewhat cartoonish resumes to employers, resumes where the education and experience really don't match up, or the applicant's profile really isn't appropriate for the job in question, we might end up either getting no results because none of the resumes we sent would get any callbacks, or we would get results that were really flimsy because they represented the hiring preferences of employers who weren't paying very close attention. In other words, we would only get callbacks from employers who didn't realize that the resumes seemed a little bit fishy. So in order to get around this, the researchers use real re resumes posted by job applicants in either Chicago or Boston, scrambled some of the details so that they weren't sending an actual person's resume to a job that that person might actually want, and then put randomly chosen names onto those real resumes. So specifically, what they did is they applied for every open position in Chicago or Boston, advertised in the sales occupation, administrative support, clerical services, and customer services. And for each of those jobs, they posted four, they sent four different resumes. Two of those resumes were going to be rated as high quality by the research assistants on this team. And two of them were rated as low quality based on the education level, experience, um, gaps in, in employment history, et cetera, of the applicants. One of the two high quality resumes was randomly selected to have a black name and the other was randomly selected to have a white name. One of the two low quality resumes was randomly selected to have a black name and the other was randomly selected to have a white name. So essentially what we're doing is we're sending to each, each job four resumes, two white and two black, and we're trying to see whether they, they give a call back to the white applicants at a higher rate than, than to the black applicants. Okay, so given that this is their strategy, how are they gonna be able to do this analysis? How do we use this strategy to get to unbiased results about the, the racial prejudice of employers? The important thing to note here is that the applications that we're sending, the resumes that we're sending to these jobs are not in fact identical. In other words, when we send four resumes to an employer, two high quality and two low quality, the black resume and the white resume that we send to a specific employer are different from each other. They might have different experience, different schools listed, different prior employers listed. And so we wouldn't necessarily be able to conclude that a particular employee is racially prejudiced because they responded to the resume with the white name as opposed to the resume with the black name, because that particular employer received two different resumes. Now, the reason for doing this is clear enough, right? If we send two truly identical resumes to the same employer and they go through the resume screening process, they might notice that they have two applicants that look exactly the same and get a little bit suspicious. So if we're not able to do that, if we're not able to say that, the, that any particular employee is biased, why are we able to say that the overall pool of employees must be discriminatory if they respond to white resumes at a higher rate than black resumes? Well, effectively, the reason that we can do this is because the assignment of names to these resumes is random. So we should expect that the black resumes have the same characteristics on average as the white resumes. And if employers prefer various characteristics unrelated to race, such as particular colleges or particular types of work experience, the resumes with black names are gonna have those characteristics at exactly the same rate as the resumes with white names. And so as a result, all we need to do to compare the, to, to determine whether employers are, are making prejudice decisions is compare the average response rate for resumes with black names to resumes with white names. And when we do that, what we're gonna find is large persistent differences in callbacks between white and black resumes. So as you can see here, when we look at the full sample, we're gonna see that a little less than 10% of the white resumes received callbacks as opposed to a little bit less than six and a half percent of, of resumes with African-American names, which is to say that the, the resumes with white names got callbacks at a rate of about one and a half times that of, of resumes with black names. In other words, as the researchers point out, this suggests that if you have a white name, all else equal, you need to send 10 resumes to get one callback, whereas if you have a black name, you would need to send 15 resumes to get one callback. Or another way to think of it, the pool of potential interviews is going to be only two thirds as large for black applicants as for white applicants in Boston and in Chicago. The other thing they point out here is that these differences are remarkably persistent for um, their two cities, right? They've got the same exact ratio of callbacks in Chicago and Boston, despite having different overall rates of callback. The, the difference in callbacks for black, 
for black women and for black men compared to white women and white men are going to be exactly the same, the same one and a half percent rate. And the differences between the, the four occupations that they look at are also fairly small. They see a lower relative callback rate for administrative jobs than for sales jobs, but otherwise they don't see very much of a difference. So the paper's other major finding is that not only do black resume or black named resumes receive lower callback rates than white named resumes, but also black applicants in their sample, so they're fictitious black applicants, get a smaller advantage from having a high quality resume than do white applicants. So as you can see here, the callback rate for resumes with white names that are rated by the researchers themselves as being high quality is about 11%, whereas the callback rate for resumes rated as low quality is about 8.5%, which means that if you've got a high quality resume, according to the researchers, and you're white, you've got a 30% higher likelihood of getting a callback on any particular application. In contrast, the difference is pretty small for black resumes, for black named resumes. The callback rate for high quality resumes with, with African American names is only about 6.7%, as opposed to about 6.2% for low quality resumes, meaning that black applicants get a much smaller advantage from having a, a high quality resume, right? Only about an 8% advantage. And the same thing is true if instead of deciding for themselves whether a resume is high quality or low quality, the researchers let the data tell them by scoring resumes on a variety of different characteristics and then seeing what the predicted callback rate is for the resumes based on their characteristics. So using this approach, they're gonna find that about 13.5% of the high quality white resumes get a callback as opposed to about 7.2% of the black, I mean, sorry, of the low quality white resumes. So you're almost twice as likely to get a callback if you have a high quality versus low quality resume and you're white. Whereas the difference is only about a 60% higher callback rate if you've got a high quality versus a low quality resume and you're black. And they'll see the same thing if they look characteristic by characteristic and try to see how various um, characteristics that predict better or lower quality resumes affect your likelihood of getting a callback if you're white versus if you're black. So for example, this first characteristic here is gonna tell you what's the effect of an additional 10 years of experience on your resume if you're white versus if you're black versus for the full sample. And what they're gonna find is that having an extra 10 years of experience on your resume is gonna increase your callback rate by about 13% if you're white and only by about 2% if you're black. And they'll see the same thing across the board for all of these different characteristics that they look at, right? Whether you have an email address listed on your resume, whether you have prior military experience, whether you received honors in college, um, whether you rate yourself as having computer skills or various specialized skills, across each of these categories, we're gonna see that the effect of your resume characteristics on your likelihood of getting a callback is gonna be higher if you have a white name than if you have a black name. And so they're gonna look at this and they're essentially gonna say, the best explanation we can think of for this set of results is essentially that employers are throwing out resumes with black names on them without paying that much attention to them. They're just focusing less on these details. And so as a result, black applicants are gaining less of an advantage by having impressive credentials and impressive qualifications because they're just not being considered. 